There's a thin line between heroism and madness. Here the line fades to nothing at all. This is a world of capes and lunatics. And nothing is off limits. <laughs> hey, welcome to this week's Capes and Lunatics episode. We are talking comics, reviews, and of course, the prerequisite random nonsense. I'm Lilith, and joining me this week, as always, are my lovely fellas, my helpers. Who wants to introduce themselves first? Uh, it's Charlie the Professor Esser, here oh, live from Michigan. I wouldn't want Charlie this week. Hey, hey, oh. still. See, that's why I jumped onto it. Because if, if I didn't see Charlie, <laughs> yeah. everyone would want to be Charlie. <laughs> All right. So, I did a lot of these books. I got a lot of, uh, I got like four books. I know you guys got probably a lot more of DC and Marvel stuff. So, I'll let you guys go first. Okay. Well, um, I actually, uh, um, I really only got two books this week, um, which I don't have with me, uh, uh, which were Secret Empire, which was very good. I enjoyed. And Occupy Avengers, which makes me so sad because it says to be concluded. They looks like they are ending Occupy Avengers. On 10, right? Or nine? I don't know. The next one. I think nine. Yeah. Because this was eight this week. Yeah, because it said to be concluded next issue, and it's like they they just introduced Mister Fantastic, and they need to. I, personally, I want Mister Fantastic to be have his own spinoff. Um, Wheels Walensky, who now has a oh, what do you call that? With a robot, you're inside the robot, and it fights. Robotech. No, yeah, but they have a special term for that genre. Tristan, what's it called when you're inside a robot and the robot's fighting? Uh, he he would know. Anyway, I figured you guys, you're the anime people. Uh, oh, my I anime. Know. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I thought you, I don't know, you guys are random nerds. I assume you, you know the nerdy stuff I don't. <laughs> you're millennials. You millennials, you know these things. Okay, Benny. Yes, I know. That's funny. Um, oh, why can't I remember what that's called when you're inside? I know they called them Jaegers in the uh, thing, but I don't know if that was specific to. Um, to Pacific Rim. But yes, yeah, so he's inside. So the Fantastic, which is bigger on the inside than the outside, uh, actually transforms into a robot. Wheels Walensky, he like links into it cybernetically and he fights as the team's tank. Uh, and I call him Mr. Fantastic because when they introduced the character, you had um, Hawkeye referring to the van as Fantastic. And so when, once Wheels becomes bonded with the machine, clearly he becomes Mr. Fantastic. And then uh, you had, um, then also what was like so powerful in this. And, you know, I don't know if they killed Nighthawk in, an, in, like, in another series, another book. If like one of the books I didn't pick up has Nighthawk dying, being shot by... Uh, Hydra out of uniform as just a guy on the street resisting. Um, but I also think that there's maybe even such a, you know, I don't know if that's what Walker wanted or they said, Hey, look, you got two issues left, man, make them count. Uh, he put, you know, but even, but if that was his intent to have him kind of die off panel as just one more random bit of violence, uh, I think it makes this great statement about how quickly people forget all the people who die of violence every day, especially violence perpetrated by law enforcement on certain groups of people, um, and whether or not people justify it or not, you know. Uh, but Nighthawk was killed, and uh, Tilda Johnson now is wearing the Nighthawk costume, Nighthawk armor, armor which is pretty awesome. And, you know, you have all this great establishment of characters and ideas, and then we're going to end it. It's so disappointing. So very disappointing. I finally got, and of course, you know, Red Wolf, who is rapidly becoming one of my favorite characters, um, you know, and still hasn't got had that much to do. He just sort of stands there and looks cool. Um, (laughs) Kind of reminds me of uh, the episode of The Simpsons where, uh, Marge, where, where Homer makes a deal with the mob to help uh, Marge's pretzel business take off, and then the other women of Springfield hire the Yakuza to take out her mob guys. So in the turf, deadly turf war, and uh, 
and there's just a little guy who's standing over the o- over in the middle of the fight, and Homer says, oh, don't make me leave, Marge. There's just a little guy standing there. You know when he does something, it's going to be awesome. And then he turns away, and you hear her go, ah! And, you know, that's sort of how I felt about Red Wolf. He doesn't do much, but you know as soon as he does something, it's going to be awesome. And now he may never do nothing. Um, I'm just really sad to see this book end like that. I mean, I am very excited about the next issue. I bought every issue. It's on my pull list. It was the only Avengers when I cut all my Avengers books. It was the only one that survived. And I'm very sad that it's leaving. Very disappointing. What do you think? We'll get thoughts, to my though? theories on Marvel when we get them more, the news. More okay. Than we see. And then, um, and then the other book I read, um, well, the other book I purchased this week, um, or that's on my pull list this week. I've read. I haven't actually put the cash into for it, but I actually did read it, and it is on the ones that's on my pull. So it is the one that I'm buying. It's Secret Empire, which was pretty good, but most yes, mostly because you know we've been working on this fan theory about um, Steve Rogers, how crowded Steve Rogers' brain is, and we kind of got confirmation of that this week because what Phil and I have been saying is that. The last time the Red Skull tried to take over Steve Rogers' body, it was after Steve Rogers had been shot and he was, his consciousness was lost in time. And bada, 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 bada. Uh, also, an interesting thing is there's re- there's uh, references in that that suggest that maybe he had visions of Secret Empire. It's weird with Marvel sometimes where you think they actually do have this stuff plotted like 20 years in advance. There was like... There was a, there was, what was it, I think, was it during, it was, it was before Age of Ultron, uh, the Avengers go in f- to the future to fight Kang, and there's like Tony Stark, and on the wall is written like a bunch of events, some from the past, and some that hadn't happened yet, but that, you know, including Age of Ultron, and then like other things, and I want to go back there to see how much of that, how much was actually in there, but um, in, uh, well, Steve Rogers was was in his he gets a vision of the future and in the future he sees you know all the heroes are dead you see these big tentacle things uh attacking these robot tentacles which of course everyone just assumes are like martian walkers but now when we see the the hydra helicarriers you go oh was that something so it's interesting that um but during that period there comes a time where um the Red Skull, he's trying to take over Steve's mind, gets transferred into his mind, and basically what it is is they do the battle in the brain, and then Steve locks the Red Skull away. And then we never had to worry about the Red Skull again. Um, no, not so much. But now, as we've been seeing in this, we've been seeing like this Steve Rogers trying to get home, this person without a memory of himself, trying to walk through this forest of the mind, trying to get back to where he's supposed to be. And in the end, he is rescued by Phil. Oh, um, was it Sam Wilson? And, uh, no, the red skull. After Sam and Bucky. Yeah. After, after his friends who might be Sam and Bucky or, or Rick Jones or somebody else. Some like, uh, (laughs) yeah. Um, well, could, I know, I know. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the Red Skull. Yeah, the Red Skull is then he says, "Oh, I'm my friend. I'm here to help you." You know, uh, after he's bludgeoned uh, him. But of course, you know, and what it strikes me is this is the thing. You know, if this isn't Steve's mind, if the Red Skull has been trapped there, if the real Steve had to be locked away, the Red Skull recognizes this, sees him fighting back, realizes this might be his chance to get out. That either he can help this Steve to get back and then defeat Steve in the regular universe. Or maybe he can just make a deal that, Hey, look, I'll get you out of here, but you have to transfer me into a new body. You have to let me live again, you know? And I know you're going to say that's the worst thing you could ever do, but trust me, what you're doing right now is a thousand times worse. And I've been in this so long. I know where we're going to find it. I, I know how we can get out. I just can't get there by myself, which would make sense because obviously if he's locked away by Steve Rogers, only Steve Rogers can open the door. Um, additionally in this issue, uh, 
we find out that basically Tony's been lying to everyone. He can't track the uh, can't track the fragments. But more to the point, and this is the thing that kind of struck me on this is, you know, uh, they go to Wakanda, and because of course Wakanda has a fragment, and Wakanda's like, yeah, we're uh, we're not going to give you the fragment because you know we don't trust you, Tony Stark. We have no reason to trust you. Uh, and yeah, you say, oh, this is the way to save Steve. And what Tony and what 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 uh, T'Challa does, which I thought was actually, I thought, see, it's like if I was someone, I said, oh, that's a great idea. Is he says, why don't you give me your fragments? Mm-hmm. We'll hold them here in Wakanda, which is like the one safe place, and then we'll have all the fragments in one place. And then you know, if we need to fix Steve, we can fix Steve. You know. Um, but of course, Tony has too much hubris to allow that to happen. And T'Challa is too intelligent to avoid this. Although more to the point, this is something that I'm, I'm kind of thinking on this. One thing that, um, Selvig had said before he killed himself, when he scattered the pieces is he said, Kobik can reform herself if we just give her time. And the idea is they don't want to give Kobik time. They want to get the pieces, put the pieces back in control. And, of course, not for nothing, this is sort of what caused all this problem in the first place was them keeping the pieces separated. Um, if you really think about going back to Kobik, it was that they were trying to control the pieces without making them into a full queue because then things go crazy. And then Kobik basically just shows up. Um so I get the feeling you're going to have something similar that basically, basically you're going to have a situation where maybe all the pieces do get together and then Kobik just brings herself back together because she's had enough time to reform her consciousness. Um, and that, and, and, you know, but it's, it makes this point that no one trusts Tony for obvious reasons. People really don't trust Steve Rogers because he's obviously Hydra and, this whole Kobik pipe dream does seem kind of foolish at times because even if you could get the cube back together, that's what caused this problem in the first place. To say, oh, we can just undo it probably isn't the best use of our time. Well, that's why they're in this mess. And do you think that's like maybe the problem with like modern comics these days is like the heroes are always at each other. They can't do anything else because they're at each other's throats every two seconds. Well, but if you think about, you know, here's what it is. It's, it's, uh, I'm trying to remember who wrote this, but th- there's this idea. It was developed in the Peloponnesian War, or, or in sort of the analysis of the Peloponnesian War, like after the fact, which is that whenever you get two powers next to each other, they eventually become distrustful of each other, and then they eventually go to war. And the reality is, is that what happens is, is that the heroes eventually defeat the villains. The villains are just not that hard to defeat because the villains, the villains are by their nature fighting an aggressive war, which means that so long as, because the heroes never want to conquer the villains. They just want to live a life. So when the villains try to conquer them, all the heroes have to do is beat them back. And so the villains are always defeated. After a while, you get to a point where the villains can't mount these constant efforts and the heroes are just sort of left at peace. Once the heroes are left at peace, now they start to realize, well, what really is the difference between S.H.I.E.L.D. and Hydra? What really is the difference between Tony Stark and Doctor Doom? What really is the difference between these people that we've been trusting? You know, they have all this power. This is why the Hulk constantly is, 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 is under suspicion because he is incredibly powerful and no one knows if they can trust him because no one knows if they can trust the Hulk. We got to shoot the Hulk into space. We got to send the Hulk to some other dimension. We got to do something with the Hulk. So he doesn't pose a risk to all of us, especially if Banner isn't going to cure himself. And speaking of what about that ending? Oh yeah. Yeah. Ah, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's an option. You know, but they make the point that, well, we can only bring him back the one time and he's going to start deteriorating. Yes. And that is that they have resurrected Bruce Banner. I wonder if they're using, oh, you know what? I wonder if they're using, um, what's his name? Techniques. Hmm. Uh, Scarlet Spider. Oh, the cloning? <laughs> yeah. Because That's what I was thinking if he was a clone or not. Yeah. From that point of death and then he will deteriorate. 
because of course the man don't know how to make a proper clone. Um, you know, so the fact of the matter is that they've brought the they've brought Banner back via this method that is going to eventually decay and break down makes perfect sense. And they're going to unleash the Hulk, you know, with uh, this disoriented Banner, and all he knows is that the person who killed him was Hawkeye, and Hawkeye's in that building. So go. Go get angry and outraged about that. Smash. Hulk smash, yeah. Uh, although it's, again, this is one of these things where, where you can ask, you know, it didn't work the first time. Why is it going to work now? The fact that the mount is still standing tells you that the last time the Hulk went after the mount, it didn't. It, it, he didn't destroy it. So maybe, you know, maybe the brute force isn't the way to go. Oh, also, most important, we found out who the traitor is, and it's actually someone I predicted. Hmm. The traitor was Mockingbird. Mm-hmm. And I predicted back when they first showed that there was a Hydra traitor in the Avengers, because I said the way they're designing the foot looks like a woman's foot, and that there was a knee pad on it similar to ones that Mockingbird was wearing at the time. And they said, well, it couldn't be Mockingbird but because she's lying. Although, interestingly enough, in recent Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s books, they actually gave her freaking wings so she could fly. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, well, maybe she actually is a scroll, and maybe she may still be a scroll. We don't know quite what Mockingbird is yet, but we do know that she was the traitor. She was the mole on the inside, which was interesting because when they flashed to that in the previous issue, they strongly implied it was going to be Quicksilver. And they kept on heading and said, I'm not here for your little war. I'm only here to for my sister, mm-hmm. you know? And so that was interesting. That was interesting. So there was a lot going on in uh, Secret Empire. This was five. Yes. Yeah, Secret Empire 5. There was a lot going on in it. But yeah, we got our final reveal that, yes, Mockingbird is the traitor, as I said all along. Basically, obviously, Nick Spencer has been secretly listening to us all these years. He's obviously a huge fan of the show. So, Nick, glad you like our ideas. Glad you like our theories. Glad you're bringing them all in. And uh, happy to just be on the team, quite frankly. Yeah. And those were those were the books that were my books that I read. Phil, what books did you read? Because I know you read a lot more. All right. Well, we're keeping it to the three to five. So, uh, of course, I'll do five. Uh, there you go. Well, I, did, I only did two. So, he, so you're already okay at four. And then you were just getting an extra one. All right. Uh, I know Lil read uh, Detective Comics 959 because Zatanna was in it. Yeah. Who was in it? Zatanna. Zatanna? Zatana. Oh, Zatanna, Zatanna, Zatanna. Oh, yeah. Look, fishnets, see? Yeah, you know, because... And a midwife now. Does she, is she? Is she, like, not wearing, like, a full tuxedo thing anymore? She's just got, like, a, a halter on in that picture? Yeah, she got, like, the... Uh... Yeah, that's her... Yeah, she's got, like, her exposed midriff there. No, I don't think... I think that's just, like, the coloring, maybe. Oh. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a shirt. I'm pretty sure, yeah. This part's a shirt, yes. I think that's a belly button I'm seeing. Phil only reads it for the articles. <laughs> oh, listen to you. What was it? A lot I'm just... Of, in the recent just, race world, uh, Lilith said she loves the Tana because she loves uh, fishnets. Well, I like the fishnets, too. I look... Li- I like the fact that she dresses like a magi- like like a stage magician. I think that's a cool thing. It's a nice little, I mean, like, yeah, a female assistant to a stage magician, but she's still the magician. She's wearing the hat. Um, and it's a nice throwback to, you know, like Mandrake and all the other, and I guess her father who also dressed like a stage musician. Or, or, or Monaco, Prince of Magic. Who also st- dressed like a stage magician, uh, which which was, of course, they're all um, uh, plays on Mandrake, Mandrake the magician, the greatest magician of them all. So, uh, yeah, because you know, uh, I, like in the you know, like ever since the animated series they made it, so um, Zatanna and Bruce Wayne have history because I guess he trained with her father and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, so, yeah, he, he, yeah, he le- did that to learn sort of hand. Never thought to learn magic, though. <laughs> that man don't need no stinking magic. He's Batman. Come on. I, I, guess, I, guess he has trouble, I guess he has trouble speaking backwards. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, if he's always trying to defeat Superman, that would have been a great thing. And I'm sure he's like, mm-hmm. oh, I should have learned the magic. That's so much cheaper than getting this thing kryptonite every time I want to fight him. Seriously, how hard would it be just to learn how to say kryptonite backwards? Well, but that would make that would make him stronger. 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, the tan is magic. She says that everything backwards. So yeah, no, I know that that's how her magic like works. Because apparently, people at DC did not did not have the time to 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 think of rhymes for hoary hosts of Hogarth. <laughs> so, so Lilith, did you like the issue? Uh, it was okay. I'm getting real tired of DC and Marvel, so it's just like I'm just biding my time to that thousandth issue so I can just get the damn $50 book and be done with it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, and they're bringing up back all that Asriel. Uh, it looks like they're rebuilding Gene Paul Valley's all full history uh, and everything, and how long till he gets yes. his own book again? Shut your, don't put that in the atmosphere, Philip. Don't do it. We don't need another no, we don't need Hey, that. he got 100 issues back in the day. You never know. Believe me, I know. Still yeah. been The first 20 were good. And then it's like, okay, now you're just dragging it out because you're DC. It's what you do. Well, maybe if Denny O'Neill would let anyone else write that book, but yeah, didn't he write like all 100 issues? It's like, let's get a fresh take in here. <laughs> no comment. No, no comment. I did. <laughs> I like Diddy O'Neill. One day, hopefully, we'll have an interview with him. So I'm just, I'm neutral. Sure. I'm not have a problem. I'm just saying, you know, keep it fresh. All right. In a book, I know Charlie Esser. If you, well, did you say you read part of this? Oh, actually, I did get to finish that. I did get to oh, finish did that. What did you think? Yes, yes, and I did like that. You know. Ah, uh, you know, um, it, it exposes everything wrong with Peter Parker. Mm-hmm. As always, as as um, as Marco, Ms. Marconi says, what were you going to do? Just run out of there. He said, which were you going to do? Fly to space or fly to New York? You know, um, you know, and of course, in both cases, he would have been stopped by a wall um, by the time he got there. Uh, sad. Um, Hide your cap in his you wall, know, man. Yeah, he builds too. <laughs> make, make it Manhattan pay for it. Yes, uh, and how are they paying? Um, but you know what? Actually, that. Rem- but you know what? This actually reminded me of hmm. was from uh, the Secret Wars when New Year vows when everyone went to fight. Uh, what's his name? The Regent, mm-hmm. and he was the one hero who wasn't there. And of course, that meant that everything had to fail because how can we win without Spider-Man? He sticks to walls after all. What, who, who, can de- <laughs> who can defeat a man with the powers of a spider? Who? Yes. Um, that it's, it's a little self-important to assume that the entire hero, that all the heroes fell because Spider-Man didn't show. He's the linchpin. You- He's the moral support. <laughs> leave, my, leave my sweet baby Pete alone. <laughs> He's he, got he, he's got pow- he's gotten power. He's beat he beat Fire Lord single handedly one time. Oh, I'm I'm sure he did. <laughs> you know you know that episode of Kim Possible where they're trying to figure out why Kim always uh, wins and they re- and at first it's they think because it's- her dad is a is a you know and a, a rocket scientist and her mom is like a neurosurgeon. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it's it's that she which <laughs> it's that she always hung out with Ron the Ron factor. Although in the end they realized no, it wasn't the Ron factor at all. It was the Rufus factor. Uh, yes, I- <laughs> Although, you know, you can realize there was like, there's there's some real coded stuff there first. Well, it's not you, Kim Possible. It's the man you hang out with. Then actually, it's not even the man. It's that he has a long flesh colored tube in his pants. A naked <laughs> mole rat. For yes. those who have never seen the show. You've never seen Kim Possible? Oh, I have. I don't know if oh. Bill has. <laughs> oh, okay. You've never seen Kim Possible? Oh, it's a really good series. It's a really good series. It is. Although, like I said, I've always, it always disturbed me to whenever Rufus, the naked role mat, would climb out of his pants and look around. And it's like, they're just, they're just trolling the deviant art people now, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> Rufus. It's, it's a flesh colored tube, lives in his pants, has a mind of its own, and is smarter than Ron. <laughs> Yeah, so some very disturbing coded language there. Okay, moving right along. All right, well, if Charlie's done tearing down Spider Man, uh... <laughs> but then the one true Spider Man comes back. That's right, Ben Riley, Scarlet Spider. <laughs> <laughs> 
Blasphemous. <laughs> I know. Look, Ben Riley, Kane, it's coming. The SmackDown's coming. We don't get the actual fight this issue, but Scarlet Spider versus Scarlet Spider. We just get we just get the um hilarious, you know, Kane's tracking down Ben and you know, everybody in Vegas thinks he's Ben Riley or or Peter as he's calling himself. Mm. I don't know. I, I like this book. I like Peter David's uh, writing. And uh, you think this book is 90s now. I see in a couple issues, the slingers are coming in. Yeah. Yes. That's the only good thing. Yes. The 90s. Well, the 90s How were a big comic book, man. Mm-hmm. All the best comic well, books were written in the 90s. Well, it's 90s, baby. You got you to read that book. You know, okay. Charlie Esser, if it's not, if it's not Otto Octavius in a Spider-Man suit, he Charlie, Charlie wants no part of it. Uh, well, because that's because all these Spider Men's are menaces, menaci. <laughs> these Spider's Men are, yes, that's correct. These Spider's Men are <laughs> menaces, and uh, yeah, and e- even even the webware was stolen. Uh, you know, <laughs> not an original thought in Peter Parker's head, and. His web food was actually stolen from the Spider Queen. Uh, um, web web fluid web, web fluid was actually created in a in a Golden Age book and used by a woman. I believe she was called the Spider Queen. Uh, her her husband actually invented this stuff. Then he got killed. But she uses the formula to fight crime by spinning webs at people and swinging and stuff. Look it's it like up, the, people. It's a real thing. It's like the whole Barry Allen, Jay Garrick thing. He had Peter Parker had a dream about it, and that's how he came up with it. <laughs> or he just recreated the formula. You know, scientists do that all the time. Like concrete. You know, we actually forgot how to make uh, concrete for centuries. They almost had concrete, and then everyone forgot how to make concrete. It's weird, man. People forget stuff all the time. You wait, You watch. One of these days, we're going to forget how computers work. <laughs> That'd be the best day ever. <laughs> be good for but us. how would we talk to you, Lilith? Yeah, oh, yeah. no. I love living in the future. It's fun. I don't want to live in the past anymore. It was boring. All those, all those cave drawings. He, he can't go yes. back to that. Corded problems. <laughs> <laughs> what image books did you get? Go. Uh, I got Spawn two seventy five. Surprise! There. They're still writing that character. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, he actually evolves and grows because I mean, people are actually aging in this aging in this book, and like, it used to be more like supernatural. Now they're kind of playing him almost. I mean, it's still dark, but he's still like closer to like an actual superhero. And mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, not like unlike the other books, like people are actually aging and growing, and mm, that's cool. I feel like that movie was a really big disservice and turned a lot of people off that because it's nothing like the movie was just I mean like Constantine levels of wrong about <laughs> mm-hmm. the, the, the HBO animated series was a lot better really good, yeah. yeah well isn't that always the case that the HBO version is usually much better than you know Not always. for the Watchmen I was gonna say I guess yeah. we'll see with Watchmen yeah yeah but um, yeah, aren't they working on another movie, and like a new Spawn movie? Well, Todd McFarlane's been saying that for years. But... Yeah, I was gonna say, um, water's wet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's see if they can get the funding. <laughs> well, once once Spider Man Homecoming comes out, which is getting fantastic reviews, he's gonna say, "Hey, my character has eyes like Spider Man." Um, <laughs> I have Devil Spider Man. You know. And really, you know, you had, uh, you know, and Fox has, of course, their murder Spider-Man. And and, and you watch, they're going to bring in Slade and says, he's also murder Spider-Man, but n- not as mouthy. Uh, they all just stole Spider-Man eyes. That's, That's right. The- oh, good Lord. Yeah. All right. They all stole from Ditko is what I'm saying. Well, Ditko, you yeah. know. Although there are those that say Ditko stole it from Kirby, so you know. They all stole from each other. Yeah, well, of course they did. Because no one thought this stuff was going to be worth anything at the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like as soon as it becomes a billion dollars, they're like, no, 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 I did that, I did that. It's like, yeah, you know. Uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> all right, my last pick, uh, Renato Jones, Freelancer, Season 2, Number 2. 
Hmm. Ends with both on hey. his book. Hmm. As he's got Spider-Man eyes too. <laughs> yeah, but this book, this book is really good. It's it's um, he's kind of like a uh, like Batman, but um, well, he kills people. He by day he uh, masquerades as one of the uh, rich one percent, and then by night he uh, kills like those members of the one percent to uh, make their money off the pain and suffering of others. So all of them. Well, yeah, but like the really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like the really bad ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's fun. Like he has like his own Alfred type who helps him, and he was he's for his whole life he's been like I think in love with this woman. You know, since they were kids. But like her father is like you know one of those rich one percent, and uh, he was he's just been elected president of the United States. Mm. Oh boy. Yeah, so I mean, Leonardo Jones did I, his I, real, Um. <laughs> Trump. That's all I need to know. She's a blonde. Yeah. Um, uh, well, it's, it's funny because Renato Jones, like, he's not he's not like the real Renato Jones because like the real Renato Jones went missing as a kid. And like, uh. you know, like like the fam I think the parents died too, but the rest of the family came looking for him and like to, ugh, forget the guy's name, the one who's like his Alfred, um, brings in like this orphan kid and says, yeah, you just masquerade as uh, you know, cause the real Renato Jones went missing pretty young. So, you know, and he's been missing for years. So anything you don't know, you can chalk up to. So they've so, been kind so, of masquerading and going so, on this mission. So to kill basically the, 1%. the entire plan was, 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 was Alfred trying not to get fired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh man, if I don't got a kid in this house, I'm going to, I'm not going to have a job. And okay. kill some rich white people. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? She shouldn't have insulted his sandwich. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. Yeah. So, you know? Um, yes, we've all read that, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is a really good book. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, interview uh, Kari Andrews twice. And uh, Charlie, an- another uh, nice Canadian fellow. So Yeah. It's all because of free health care, man. Makes you mellow. <laughs> Makes you not worried about stuff. You can actually focus on what's important. <sighs> oh, Miss Hellfire, what were your picks of the week that were um, Marvel or DC? Since I, I, I don't know why I did this to myself, three to five, because there was like a lot of number ones that I wanted to talk about, but I'll just talk about the, the creme de la creme. Uh, we'll start with American Mythology Stargate Universe number one. If you love the TV show, Stargate Universe, or just the Stargate actual TV series and movie universe, this is the book for you. It really encapsulates all the characters, and it picks up right where the series ended. Um, This is like a cold show. So if you don't know about Stargate Universe, it's okay. You're like, wait, they still made one after SG-1? Yeah, they made like three more. But yeah, (laughs) the art was great. The story was tight, fast-paced. I'm impressed. It took forever to get this up, but it's finally here, so I'd recommend it. Uh, my Archie kick, uh, Jughead number 16, of course. Um, I feel like they're losing steam with Jughead. I hope they don't start pulling from the TV show, because I don't actually, like, at the end of season one, I don't know where they're going, and I don't care. So don't let that influence anything other than the actual comic books that are based on the TV show now. So that that's my, I, I'm just worried about poor little Jughead right now. Cause. Well, so how are they, because how do they play Jughead in this? Because I know, like, in the in the old school, Jughead was always kind of, you know, he was kind of, he, he was almost exactly the Maynard G. Krebs character. You know, he was the, he was the comic relief. He was, you know. Guy who marches to his own drum and has his we own. Know all that, but also broody. It's like season one angel meets like I don't know. How do you make Jughead broody? His name is Jughead. Exactly. Maybe so that's, that's the reason. I'm like a little worried about like the actual TV show like creeping in on this book. But see, no, it's still fun, but it, I, I feel like they're running out of ideas for Jughead, which would be fair. Archie's been going on for a really long time. <laughs> but you know what? Here's what I'm going to tell you. There, well, you see, uh, you know what? I'm going to tell you the exact problem was when they decided to make him asexual. Nothing against asexual people. but what, And I don't know if he's aromantic as well, but when you take that off the table, you also take off a lot of interesting stories for fiction 
And, you know, one of the things that, and this is, this is what I was going to say is that, you know, when you look at, um, cause very, very much, you know, I mean, Jughead obviously predates Manor G. Krabs. Manor G. Krabs is kind of a Jughead character, but even Jughead is actually based off of another character from other teen comics that were written before the Archies. Um, which is why there's like a thing with the the letters on his hat that like they don't match his name, but just because they just copied the letters from the other guy's hat. Um, it's all uh, Brian Cronin can you can look it up on uh, Comic Book Legends Revealed. But um, Maynard G. Krebs, he was always this character who is you know he's just the the goof off who is friends with the with the lead. Um, but because he was the goof off, he actually had a lot more depth because his whole point was i don't need to be the lead i'm just living my life i'm not trying to i'm not trying to work a scheme i'm just trying to live my life and so when you would have romantic entanglements they didn't necessarily have to have dramatic wake because it was all about other people trying to navigate his world not him trying to navigate yours and when you take if you take off um if you take off that that intergender or even same gender romantic entanglement, you limit the reasons why people want to interact with that character. I don't know. I actually found Jughead more interesting once it was like very like pronounced and it was asexual because basically he would make love to a hamburger and I've had that feeling too. So I feel like that made Jughead more relatable for me. Like, <laughs> well, that, that's a that's a whole other <laughs> sexual dynamic. If, if 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 no, I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that's a whole other thing. Yeah. In that case, it's it's not you know he has attractions. They're just you know non human. Uh, that, that's a whole other bag of hammers. But what I think, and and I'm not saying that's what it does. I'm just saying if you're making him broody, okay, so he's separated from general society. He's broody. Why do people want to interact with him? The point of Jughead was that people still wanted to interact with him. The point of Major G. Krebs is people still want to interact with him because he is this guy who makes his own world because he as himself is at peace. But once you make him broody, then he's no longer at peace with himself. Why do you want to be with him? Well, I, I guess they're trying to reflect the millennial culture because apparently millennials are broody. That's like a word that yeah. describes... People have always been broody. You know, that's, know. that's not new. <laughs> and they were just as annoying when they were broody before they were called millennial broody people. So we'll, we'll just broody. Broody. I'll give it about they'll they'll turn they always kind of turn it around. Like it takes a little dip and then it comes back up. So this was just yeah. on a little dip. So um next issue should be on the way back up. Okay? I really gotta start reading the Archies because I really do you get your I bang for your buck. I mean it's like that thick. <laughs> Lots of backups, lots of other stuff besides, you know. So that's why I, I started reading Archie comics. Okay. It's ridiculous, the prices for comic books nowadays. Um, there's this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this company, Black Mask. No. Oh, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I've heard of them. Yeah. Yeah, I've so, heard of them too. I tend to pick up their number ones. I, I tend to not follow through. I get to like issue three and then I forget. But I saw a number one. It was called Beautiful Canvas. It was highly reviewed. So I picked mm-hmm. it up. And so it's written by uh, Ryan K. Lindsay with art by Sammy K- Kavila. And it's $3.99. And it's about a hit woman hired to kill a small child. Uh, it's dark and I like it. <laughs> okay. You're allowed to like, like dark things, Lila. That's okay. Yeah. And it's, it's, the world's also kind of set in like this bio. So I, I don't know. It's a lot of um, interesting dynamics to be explored. I hope I can remember to keep up with this because my comic books don't have it. My comic book shops don't have this. So I have to like set a reminder for Comixology or something. <laughs> but no, yeah, you, I had- you, you can't just tell your guy to order it for you? I don't even like dealing with them anymore at this point. Okay. Everything's comicology at this point. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Amazon, which are the same you, company actually now. Yes, and, and you know what? And when you talk about why the comic shops are are falling apart, you know, yes, part I of the know. Is, I can't get into it. It's just no, like no, 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 no. Actually, no. Damn millennials. No. No, no, I wasn't going to blame you. I was going to say it's the fact was. that you're that when Lilith goes there, she's not getting that customer service. She's not being welcomed as the customer. She, you know, and granted, yeah, you have that problem with people ordering books and not picking them up. 
And obviously, you, I mean, that's business. You have to know who you're dealing with. But if you have a person with a pull list who buys their pull list, you know, because if you're pulling books, you're not buying, then you're just a bad, you're just a horrible human being. But if you, if you get, if you get it pulled, you buy that book. And if you say, oh, I meant to drop that book last week. It's like, well, then you drop it next week. Okay. <laughs> Hell no. You didn't, you, you didn't drop it in time. You got to buy it. And honestly, that's when you start calling because you say, okay, you're looking at your big stack and you say, okay, I take this. I'm buying this one, but take this off my pull list. I'm buying this one, but take this off my pull list. Take these all off my pull list because these stories aren't in. Yeah. They're horrible. So what are you all thinking? six of them are horrible. Anyway. So what is it? So what is it? They're just like, ew, a girl. That's what it still feels like. I'm just like, what is this? The Big Bang Theory? Like, what? what did I walk into that comic book shop? Okay. But anyway, did, yeah. Did I, was did I disappear on you guys? or Indifferent. No, you're there. Oh, okay. I, yeah, because every so often you freeze. And I don't know if I'm seeing you freeze and I'm frozen to you or what's going on. Uh, the hotel Wi-Fi is a little spotty. Um, but yeah, but. <laughs> But what I'm saying is what's killing comic book stores, I don't think it's other options. I think what's killing comic book stores is that not every person who opens a comic book shop should really be in business. You know, there there are people that fall in love with comic books, not comic book readers. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, well, that's I mean, that's the biggest mistake people make in business. They say, oh, I want to open a coffee house because I love coffee. I want to open a bar because I'm an alcoholic. They never think how much of opening a coffee house or a bar is mopping floors and cleaning dishes and, you know, tabulating receipts and, and you know, dealing with vendors and, and 90, per, like, you know, drinking coffee or alcohol is like the smallest part of your job in a coffee house or a bar. You know, it's like saying, I'm a great cook. I want to open a restaurant. It's like cooking is the smallest part of your job at a restaurant. It's important. You have to be able to do it, but it is a very small part of your job. And likewise, if you are a comic book aficionado, reading comic books is probably the smallest part of your job as a comic book salesman. Mm-hmm. Do you think? And that's what you, kills comic books and stores. Do you think some of them get too big for their own good? Because, like, I know I go to a small shop, and the only employee is the owner, so I'm dealing with the owner every week. You know, yeah. is it is it different if it's like you're dealing with the owner as opposed to just like some employee who gets minimum wage or whatever? Yeah. Well, you know, I, yeah. Yeah. What I think it is is if you're if you're the owner who's behind the counter, then here's what I'll say: if you go to a store that's been open for a long time, mm-hmm. then I think you can say that is a place where they've understood that it's a customer service business because they've survived the last cycle you go to a place that's relatively new and you're not dealing with the owner then that tells you you know they may not be there to really sell comic books you know it's uh, comic books where the comic books are like this big and everything else are overpriced collectibles <laughs> oh yeah well you know and hey a lot of stores thrive on their collectibles you know yeah um and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing you know, but I think even with the collectibles market, it's the same shtick. It's the same thing. You have to, you know, you have to let people know here's what's coming out. Stock this, you know, you know, unless unless all you're doing is little vinyl, you know, the little vinyl Funko Pops or the little box, you know, the mystery boxes. Um, you know, you know, there's cost involved in carrying these things, and you have to know what people really want, and you have to interact with them, and you have to let them know what's coming out. <laughs> This is a tough business. Um, there's another number one that I want to talk about. Um, the reason mm-hmm. why I picked it up is because it was written by um, Alex DeComp- uh, DeCompe. Uh, he wrote Archie versus Predator. So, and he also uh, has an Eisner. He was an Eisner nominee. So he's always been kind of on my radar since then. And uh, it's called Bank Shot Number One. It's kind of like Green Arrow with a gun. <laughs> He has like this whole Robin Hood mentality, but you know, one man's freedom fighters, another man's terrorists is basically the basis of this comic book. Does he have trick bullets? <laughs> Not yet. This is only issue number one. So watching, watching oh, okay. bullets. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot of stuff blowing up. A lot of action. So I, I like stuff like that too. Very diverse taste in comic books. So I like mm-hmm. the first issue. I definitely know with Dark Horse, I can keep up with Dark Horse pretty well. They're they're very heavy on my pull list. So I'm looking forward to issue number two. 
Uh, I thought the artwork was really standout. It was by Criss Cross. I think the last thing that uh, you guys might know is Convergence Justice League of America. I thought that artwork was phenomenal for that book. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's keep up with this because it seems like it's going to be a pretty good one. So, yeah, yeah. I, know Chris, oh. I, know, I know Chris Cross. He was like big in Marvel in like the late 90s, early 2000s. And of course, Batman Elmer Fudd. <laughs> <laughs> Love these Looney Tunes uh, crossover team ups. Like, oh my gosh, this is the best one so far yet. Sorry, I didn't read Banana Split, so I can't say if it's better than that. But uh, it's even better than the Lobo one that I talked about last week. So you should pick it up when you get a chance. I hope they come out with like, uh, I hope they put out like a whole a trade of those. I think that would be it would sell because they've they've just been so good. The artwork is so great, and these stories they actually tried. (laughs) It's not just a cash grab. (laughs) They actually tried. So I'm happy with the outcome of it. That's sad that like, that's like the big compliment we can get Marvel or DC anymore. It's like, they tried. <laughs> it's not a cash grab. Well, it is, but it isn't. Uh, you know, I, I still like my Marvel comics and I like the DC. I mean, I like movie. them, but I mean, you could see like the, you know, the, the, All these events, it's, it's a bit yeah. the team. It really is at this point, you know, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I, I I think I think that Marvel puts out some really good books. I think that they have been very experimental and been willing to experiment. Just and you know, yeah, no, well, different color heroes, if nothing else, mm-hmm. and you know, and you know, telling different kinds of stories in different kinds of way. And yes, a lot of those different things didn't sell very well. You know. Um, the idea of a superhero romance comic in World of Wakanda probably was not something the market was ready for. I and goodness knows I didn't buy it because I had too many books, but I did enjoy the conceit of it and I read it for a few issues. But you know, after a while, I have to say, okay, what are my books? And one of your biggest problems when you do do experimental things in these mass markets is that as much as I'm interested in an experimental book. I'm also already reading these other more traditional books and I do want to keep my traditional books. I'm not going to drop a book I like that's a traditional book just because there's a book that's experimental that I also like, you know? They they flood yeah. Marvel's flooding Marvel's flooding the market cuz it's like, yeah, you you know, like you were interested in World of Wakanda, but are you going to, mm-hmm. you know, unless it's like a like an Avengers book for you, uh, unless it's like an Avengers book or something, are you, you know, at mm-hmm. 3.99 for every book, are you going to read like the second book of anything else well yeah and that that is that is their problem but of course it's also important to remember how much like i say it's the question of how much marvel is in the comic book business anymore or are they in the licensing business you know and you know that's the thing you can take a loss to create characters you know you can take that loss throwing out 20 new original ideas for characters because if one of those hits then it makes up for everything you spent. So if Tilda Johnson Nighthawk becomes a hit, it's worth any that they spent to create Occupy Avengers. You know, Occupy Avengers might have lost mon- money, but the idea of Tilda Johnson the Nighthawk could be their that could be their new Batman. You know, because it's not going to be Moon Knight. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think they need to Tilda Johnson. Uh- Nighthawk uh, solo book written by uh, well the people right here. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, that's not going to happen, Phil. Do you know how many people with podcasts want to write Marvel comics? You know what they? I know. You know what we could do is we could write a we could write a, a Tilda Johnson Nighthawk um, uh, fanfic. Okay? Well, I was going to say we got the queen of fanfic right here. Yeah, but we no, but I mean, you, we, you can write an ongoing story with these things so long as you're not making money off of it. Which technically means we can't actually put it on the Capes and Lunatics site. It has to be separated from us as as an actual thing, because otherwise, archives it's of not- our own where all the fan fiction belongs. <laughs> yes, you know, but that's you know, I mean, that's the thing. It's it's you know, but the, but like I say, Tilda Johnson Nighthawk, that character could be amazing, and it was not something I was expecting to see. And the idea that you put Tilda Johnson in the uniform have her have all this tech have her have um have an axe to grind have her be a villain who is trying to make good but is still dang well aware that she's a villain there's so many levels to this character that i think really really makes nighthawk a character on its own 
in um in in the in the Marvel universe, you know? You know, have Kyle Richmond bankroller just to j- just to appease old school fans cuz you know, he's pretty old now to be night night hawking anymore. You know. <laughs> and uh and you could have something pretty interesting there, you know? Um and you play him up as sort of like a like a '60s Batman character, and and, and the fans all love that as as sort of Hero Alfred kind of kind of guy in that story. Could be cool. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but if 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 Tilda Johnson Nighthawk becomes something that people want to read, it's worth creating it. It's there were lots of crazy characters that wandered through X Men books over the years. Deadpool's the one that hit. Deadpool pays for everybody else, you know, in the same way that, you know, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby came up with lots of concepts and characters over the years. Spider-Man pays for them, you know, and, you know, and Spider-Man paid for these guys when they weren't making money. When Iron Man wasn't making money, you know, you had Spider-Man making that money, you know, and then when Iron Man starts making money, suddenly you've got a lot more cash on hand to explore and do experimental things. And that is kind of where the Disney Marvel merger has allowed Marvel to say, well, what if we tried to look a little more like indies? What if we tried to look like people who say, we're not afraid to look at what kind of stories are out there, what stories aren't being told, you know, because we have, because we've told the story, we've already told the superhero story enough ways. Let's look at other things we can do with the genre and see how else we can make money off of it. (laughs) Because it is all about money and t-shirt sales, that's the sweetest plum. Well, spe- well, speaking of that, can we get to the, the topic I wanted to discuss? Marvel Legacy, because they released the list of, uh, you know, they said they're going to go back to legacy numbering on a lot of these mm-hmm. things, which I believe is their big plot. You know, some of maybe some of their newer characters haven't been selling so well. So hey, slap the number on there and complete us. Like some of us uh, might be like, oh hey, I might need, I need to get that book to complete my uh, collection. Yeah, you can never complete the collection, Phil. That's kind of the point. I know, but I mean, from this point, from, you know, <laughs> what's what's been so far? Because, I mean, I got the list right here. I mean, so, some of the stuff stays the same, but, of course, Amazing Spider-Man, seven eighty nine. of course. You knew that was coming. Uh, Black Panther, 166. Cable, 150. Captain Marvel, 125. Daredevil, 595. I guess, oh, I guess Deadpool's going to, uh, they're renaming it Despicable Deadpool, 287. Mm, he's despicable now, eh? Yeah, Doctor Strange 381. It's interesting. There's a Falcon number one coming out. I don't see Captain America on this list, though. Hmm. How come he doesn't get get his, get, get original numbering? Because he's had his own book, hasn't he? He had a mini series. I don't know if he oh. did. He have an ongoing. Oh, you know what? It was. Oh, you know what? Because I'm counting the ones that were called Captain America and Falcon. Yeah. And I'm surprised. I thought they'd want to cash in on that. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 146. Uh, Incredible Hulk 709, Iron Fist 73. Well, number ones still sell. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's some number ones on here. Yeah. And, and you know, for what it's worth, they're saying, and now we are committing to Falcon as, as, as a major character in the Marvel Universe. Now that he has a movie character, we're going to commit to him because we've got him on contract. And if we can make, if we can somehow talk you guys into a Falcon movie, we are making a Falcon movie. Here's, here's one Marvel 2 and 1. Didn't that go for like a mm-hmm. hundred issues? They're starting. They're they're just slapping a number one on that. They're not going like one and one or anything. Mm. Well, I mean the but original. It's a, it says the fate, one. the fate of the four. Ooh, but which four? <laughs> the frightful four, the UFOs. Actually, you know, I really want uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe to. If they don't get the Fantastic Four back, they should just incorporate the UFOs. Ooh. And act. And um and have them be sort of actually I was thinking that would be like a great thing if you ever do you could set the UFOs in the sixties of them uh, as being these kind of really not not too nice people but who are building their own rocket ship to show that capitalism can beat the commies to the moon. Um, ooh, there's a great thing. And then of course after they come back and here's the thing you do that you do that replay of um of uh. Iron Man one where Nick Fury comes out, but because it's set in the sixties, agent Carter comes out and says, you've just stepped into a bigger universe. Um, oh, Charlie, hey. Charlie, Charlie, this might anger you. Um, yes. I guess, uh, you know, the Jen Walters book that's been called Hulk. I guess they're going back to she Hulk. They're going to doing she Hulk one fifty nine. 
I'm I, I'm not offended that she's called She Hulk. I don't find she different uh, diminutive in the way that I find girl. Like if they called her Hulk girl, I would I would see that as diminutive. Which is why I don't know why Supergirl and Batgirl still insist on being girls. You know, I think they should have all the Bat women fight for who gets to be Batwoman, and then you just have to come up with another Bat name. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be Batwing, Charlie. And Barbara Gordon wins. <laughs> Um, but um, and that's the you see any of the bat people being bat boy, you know. And these are grown up women too, so it's like, why are you calling yourself bat girl? It's just a thing for me. But no, I'm fine with them going back to She Hulk. It's fine. They already have another Hulk. I actually didn't like when they had like multiple characters with the same name. Mm-hmm. You no, know, I, I was okay with it with the Captain's America though, just because I think of the Captain's America as sort of a title and. And kind of almost an organization. Team America. Team America. World Police. Um, or the original Team America, the motorcycle group, uh, with who, mm. whose powers combine to become the Marauder. And their powers combine. Yes. <laughs> but, um, I mean, well, I believe I'm correct in this Marvel's one. Marvel's first black female superhero. Oh, was it? I know that the, the person under the mask was a black woman. Is that, if I recall correctly from my wait, wait, wait. Uh, official handbook to the Marvel wait. Universe. Wait, first female black superhero. Wouldn't it, wouldn't that be a storm? Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. What? Yeah, when did? Yeah, yeah. Because she, yeah, she predates that. Yeah, she's from the yeah. '70s. So, yep. Okay, but she was still cool. <laughs> the mer- I just like the fact that <laughs> it was diversity when when you weren't expecting diversity. Uh, I mean, am I correct that th- that this is just like a money grab? Because I mean, they're probably not going to be changing much story wise. It's just going to be you know new numbers, new some new titles. Um, well, you know what? Here's what I'll say. Of course, it's a money grab. <laughs> I mean, well, first off, every yeah. time they sell a book, it's a money grab. They don't sell these books. Say, oh, we, we don't care. You know, they can <laughs> lose money on these books, but they don't want to lose money on these books. They want all of them to be hits. You know. Um. But I, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a way to draw your attention. So it's really, it's a marketing ploy, but that doesn't mean that the stories won't be interesting and that it doesn't mark a new, a new direction in Marvel's overall universal storytelling. You know, exactly what they decide to do with it. We don't know yet, but they're definitely doing something. Yeah. Yeah. I, they, 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 I think they want the cachet of DC rebirth, but they don't want to like alter any storytelling. Well, you know, because that's not their thing. They don't reboot universe. They had the chance to totally reboot the universe and they opted not to because they could have had Franklin restart their universe. You know, they could have explored other universes. They could have done parallel universe storylines. They could have done a lot of things, but they opted not to. They opted that when Franklin put the universes back, he put them back at the point when the universe last existed and made everyone notice that something was wrong (laughs) because they're like, wait a minute. We were this, 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 you know, I mean, when you look at um, the Ultimates and you realize that, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Oh, why am I forgetting Blue Marvel's actual name? That he had been studying, you know, this unobtainium thing for for decades, but now he just notices, oh, it's it's eight. There's eight uh, particles in it now instead of uh, seven like the last time. Yeah. All right. Hey, before we run out of time, we st- we have two questions of the week. Because remember, we we forgot last week. Oh. Also. Okay. So, what are our questions of the week this week? Uh, well, oh, wait, before we do that, are we not going to talk Mummy or Spider Man? Uh, Nobody needs to talk about the Mummy. That's a summation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can wait for our Spider Man review, but uh, yeah. well, well, we haven't seen um, it yet, but I, I, it's getting good reviews. It's very positive. So the first question was yours correct Wolf, about uh what crossover what's like your uh, yeah um, dream crossover? Your right up, yeah your dream crossover comic book characters no limitations can be from any universe what would it be i've already actually mine has already happened so i'm happy uh well mine would obviously be uh ambush bug uh gwenpool uh crossover because both characters are acutely aware of the fictional nature of their universes, but Gwenpool still thinks she's real, whereas Ambushbug knows he exists in a fictional universe and is of that fictional universe. Hmm. So to have them cross over creates this 
interesting take on how people approach their own fictionality in a fictional universe when they can, when they are aware of their own fictionality. Because, you know, usually when you're aware of your own fictional, fictionality, you still think of yourself as real. But Ambush Bug knows he's not real any more than anyone else is real. And so it, it would open up a great direction for uh, a delightfully absurdist nihilist uh, observation on the nature of fictionality and reality. And I would love to see that. So if they ever do a Marvel versus DC again, I definitely want Ambush Bug versus, um, versus Gwenpool. And you can have Howard and Deadpool show up too. Uh, but Gwenpool uh, versus Ambush Bug would be my dream. No, no Deadpool, Harley Quinn? Why do I care about those uh, ultra violent freaks? Um, <laughs> mine, mine, mine will never happen. But I had, the, I've had this big dream for years that, like, if Marvel and DC could get their stuff together, like, have some kind of like big cosmic like crisis level event, and like maybe for like one year, drop a DC character into the Marvel universe and drop a Marvel character into the DC universe. So Nightwing will be going to Marvel. Who's coming? <laughs> Well, you know, that was actually, I mean, that was the original thing to do with the original Marvel DC crossover, that they were going to do that, that have that one character be in their other universe for a year. But they realized, oh, the rights involved in this are just insane. The lawyers, mm-hmm. ba- the, basically, they ran up against the one power in the universe that none of them could defeat, lawyers. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I was thinking Nightwing, well, not because he's my favorite, but, like, even if they did get this together, do you really think, like, either side would let the other side, like, deal with like their big properties like they're they're not sending batman superman wonder woman the flash it's, in it's more likely you're, you're, you're getting yeah you're getting like a nightwing yeah cyborg supergirl you're getting somebody yeah you're not getting the big seven yeah uh they can send the flash that's fine <laughs> how dare you yeah you put quicksilver in in the dc universe and you know, and everyone can because you know what. Here's what I say about about Quicksilver and and Barry. I think that I think that they're both jerks. I just think that people think Barry's nicer about it. Um, I think all speedsters are generally speaking jerk jerk characters, but you know because they don't but, have patience. Yeah, well, of course they don't have patience, and I understand that, and that's why I'm sympathetic to them. But I'm just saying, I think that you know, I I, I think that people are nicer to Barry. Because Barry seems like just such a nice guy, but he's really just as just as much a jerk as everyone else. He's always breaking the time stream, and I know that's a relatively recent addition to the character. So I I, I know that wasn't how he used to be. Flashpoint. <laughs> <laughs> but once you do it, man, you just all you want to do is well, maybe I could just fix one more thing. <laughs> but no, just when I just when I yelled out, "How dare you!" That needs to be our new T-shirt. We need a picture of Little Hellfire, and it's just in big bold print. How dare you! So, who would you send to the DC universe, Phil? Uh, who do you think, Charlie? Because, like I said, you know they're not sending like the big the big names. Well, well here's what I'm gonna say. Tier. Well, this is this is this is this is anything. So you could. Yeah. So if you want to send a second tier, you can pick a second tier. You know. Well at, this, um, well, at this point, you send Steve Rogers because nobody over there knows who he is, and he gets like a little vacation from everybody who's like, "Man, you, you, you devastated the country. You blew up Las Vegas." Yeah, I, I think that would be kind of cool. I mm-hmm. think that would be a great way for him to sort of start fresh. Does he? And does maybe he, go, he does he go over as Captain America, or does he go over as like Nomad, or no? He just goes over there and he becomes a beat cop in New York. Tries to help. Tries to help in small ways. An artist, a comic book artist. Yeah, well, that's 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 his dream, man. Although they always said that he drew he drew his characters a little stiff when he went to take his artwork into Marvel Comics. They said, I don't know, you, you guys are a little stiff here. I was like, I like he says I like your perspective, but your characters look a little stiff. I remember that because he got he got criticism on his, on his uh, comic book art. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, yeah, I, I could see Captain America coming over to the DC universe and. You know, take away of it, you know? I mean, that, that's the thing about any of these characters. If you drop them in, it, here's the thing. If you take Batman and put him into the Marvel Universe, um, uh, Squadron uh, Supreme Nighthawk aside, he comes without a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. He comes over as essentially a homeless dude. 
And unless he wants to go up to people and say, I'm Batman and just Batman and try to try to ingratiate himself in the superhero community, he's got to just start over from literally nothing. And he's got to figure out what he's going to do. And I think Batman in the, in the Marvel universe as this guy who has to sort of figure out who he is in this universe you know, maybe even seeing, you know, this, is, this could always be fun is, you know, because things are fictional in, in each other's universe. So um, have him come into that universe and realize that there's like the Batman fictionality there and realize how does he define himself in this universe of superheroes if, you know, without everything that made him a superhero in his own universe. Unless, you know, unless, and you can, unless Tony Stark helps him out because, you know, that 1% helps, helps each other yeah. out. Well, yeah. Well, and you know, it could be very interesting. And of course, you know, and you know how you tell that story is you started off with him running into Gwenpool, who immediately recognizes him (laughs) and says, hey, Bruce Wayne, right? (laughs) I don't read that many DC books, but I I can tell it's you. And then we get, of course, we get the obligatory Batman Deadpool crossover. (laughs) You remind me of Deathstroke. (laughs) (laughs) Why did you say that name? Can't believe Martha. Yeah. So Martha be- now. <laughs> Damn you, Snyder. Martha. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my pick would be Constantine and Zantana meet Doctor Strange. Oh, that'd be nice. Because mm. I, I, I like the I like the, the magic of it all, the mystical elements. Yes. So you you'd have those two meet Doctor Strange. You wouldn't bring in uh, Hellstrom or Satana from the Marvel Universe too. Just Doctor Strange. <laughs> Just Doctor Strange. Keep th- that would be that would be interesting if you brought in all the magic users from like both universes because they're like oh, oh the two are, the two oh. universes are going to collide so they they, they they use all their magic to keep it you know separate for a year or whatever. Well, well you know they did do a, a thing and it's kind of an interesting thing when you want to actually look at. Uh, this broad thing, you know, when they did the the um, one of the le- later incursion events, you know, they go and they meet the Justice League, but it's like the Pastiche Justice League. That's where we get the uh, the Doctor Spectrum who came over with the Suicide Squad. Um, but you know, he goes up ag- when Doctor Strange goes up against the Doctor Fate thing and basically brings Cthulhu into his universe to destroy it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he basically rips him as saying you know you're you're not a sorcerer you're just a librarian you know you're a curator you're a librarian you don't have any power yourself you just have all these mystical relics that give you power which is ironic because of course now dr strange after the death of magic basically the same thing just a librarian just a guy with a bunch of books and it makes me wonder if part of that uh the writer on the current Doctor Strange maybe got a little offended at him ripping on librarians because you will see that that uh, Zelma Stanton is such a central character to the, to the Doctor Strange universe and how important she is as Doctor Strange librarian. So, <laughs> man, librarians and uh, like elementary school teachers, they're doing God's work, man. Yeah. Well, but the point Dr. is that Pace. you don't have someone to organize your magic. What are you going to do? You know? <laughs> So should we get to our second question? Oh, what's our second question? Um, if you could interview anyone for the podcast that are alive throughout history, who would you interview? Ooh. Okay. So here's going to be my interesting one. I would want to interview Billy and Jack Kirby, but Kirby from like after the Fantastic Four got created. I would want them both in the studio when they were still friends, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> – have them talk about, you know, how it, how they both created it and what, what they, you know, who came up with what. Because I get the feeling that if you, if, like, before they, things got sour, I bet if you actually talked to both of them at the same time, they probably would have been very, you know, oh, please, that was, you're, you're the genius. No, you're the genius. And, you know, I would love to have had that on tape back before, back before things went south. So if I could, if I could, and now of course this is like assuming we're going to do this as for a podcast silliness, and not uh, like okay, the fate of the free world says you Moses and find out you know and get to the bottom of this whole Middle Eastern religious divide thing so we can really get to get Abraham and really figure this all out once and for all. No, for a podcast, I'd say let's get Jack Stanley and Jack Kirby from from the very early days and before. 
b- b- before that comes in from the New York Times and ruins their relationship. The way they tell the story now, it was like that one guy who just totally dissed uh, Jack Kirby and the entire friendship dissolves as a result of it. It's like Jack Kirby was maybe kind of a little bit of a petty guy. That's what did it. But, you know, but now we could get that answer. And that's important to me. I just told him, make it cosmic rays. <laughs> <laughs> See, that would be great. I'd love to have that interview. And so would all of you. And you know it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Miss Hellfire. Uh, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Come on. Seriously. Of course. Joe and Jerry. That, that, that was the dream for a long time. <laughs> Superman creators, for those of us that aren't as geeky, <laughs> but you should know that you listen to this podcast. But yeah, like yeah. it just always amazes me as something that they created. You know, they were just high school kids in Cleveland, and ideas struck them, and he still lives on. You know, so yeah. What about yeah. You? Uh well, probably one of my favorite Marvel writers, Mark Grunewald, who's unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, my favorite verse, he wrote my favorite versions of Captain America, Quasar, Squadron Supreme. And, uh, and that's not a shameless plug. <laughs> that's right, Lilith. What's that? You smell a shameless plug. You could read more about my pick uh, this week on the first week of the uh, brand new Capes and Lunatics blog. And where can they find that blog, Phil? Uh, well, you can always find that on uh, southgatemediagroup.com. Oh, and I'm always putting up links on our uh, social media. So follow our uh, Capes and Lunatic social media and my website, philparage.wordpress.com. So seamless. My boy is all grown up. <laughs> I should just wear a sign that says shameless every week. Shame. <laughs> Shame. Oh. So uh, any other news? Um, I know, Lil, you, you and I talked about this earlier in the week. Uh, they're re-releasing Super Nintendo. Yes. In September, September 29th, I remember my wife's birthday. Uh, I'm so excited. It's coming now loaded with 20. We released Nintendo 64. And but yes, yeah, Super Nintendo loaded with like what is it, 21 different games? Yes, yeah, 21. Yeah. No, this is the NES, correct? <laughs> no, they they already did um they already did the classic Nintendo. Now this is the Super Nintendo. Oh, the Super Nintendo. Okay. Mm-hmm. And but it's preloaded, so it's not like you, you can go out and buy cartridges for it. Yeah, you don't have to repin or anything or <sighs> thank God. <laughs> no, but you see, here's here's what I'm gonna say. You know what would be awesome is they re- it reintroduce these old games and then they take new games, but like six true fit them. them. Make yeah. them sixty four bit. <laughs> exactly, man. That would be awesome. Uh uh. Although speaking of six bits, uh, or twenty six hundred bits, um, what is coming out soon is the new wood panel Atari, and we still know nothing about it. Um, although you know what I love about the fact that Atari is coming back is that it's coinciding with the with the coming back of Blade Runner. Oh, because there was this big joke about oh, you know, at the very start of Blade Runner, the 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 movie, they have this big Atari logo. Because Atari, you know, in the future, that's like the, one of the major providers of uh, digitized entertainments. So clearly, that that's they're going to have a logo in Times Square, and then when then of course Atari goes out of business, and everyone goes, ha ha ha! See, the future wasn't like it was predicted because you know we also don't have replicants. Um, that you know of. <laughs> But now I think it's just funny that, you know, after all that, and then as when Blade Runner is coming back, Atari is coming back too. Atari still exists. And I will be very happy to get whatever it is they're coming out with. Cause I, I like the links too, man. I didn't get to play it because, you know, it was only out there for like a hot minute, but from everything I saw about the links, it looked good. I think the Atari was always had potential, but I think, Ah, oh, that that dang et. Not too big for their britches too quickly. That's all. Okay, it's not been fifty-seven hours. Come on, Let, no, no. You just want to look at yourself on the camera. Go sit and play. We're gonna to go to the reunion in a minute. Be good. Charlie Esther's son. Okay, it's Aspie, his son loves to see himself on camera. Yeah. So, well. yeah, he wants to be on Chap Junior. He's very excited about about this. You have to be ten or eleven though, and so he's still got a couple years to wait. Or thirteen. Well, yes, you. He has to be older to get on Chap Junior, but that's his. That's his goal now. Yes. Awesome. 
So, yeah. anything else, though, or is that it? That's it for me. All righty. Uh, you want to do our shameless plugs, or shall I? I don't think that I have them memorized quite yet. I have, I have them on my handy, handy dandy iPad. This and podcast already- is not sponsored by Apple, but we're more than welcome for your sponsorship. I welcome our Apple overlords, especially if they pay us a lot. Uh, <laughs> and if you would like to uh, sponsor us or send us your feedback, you can always email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Capes and Lunatics, Twitter at Capes Lunatics, Instagram, Capes and Lunatics, Pinterest, Capes and Lunatics podcast board, and all important, the voicemail, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And if you want to know how I got so good at uh, plugs and shameless plugs, thank you, Lil Hellfire. <laughs> My OG one. All right. So you want to share some of your plugs, Charlie? Oh, well, of course, if you ever want to write to me in that old-fashioned email way, the way our Moz and Paws once did, you can always do so at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitter. This is a live tweet something, probably Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. when that comes back one of these days. And I will live tweet. Inhumans. The Inhumans. Oh. God, that trailer was a catastrophe. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's something. Well, I think we talked about Did we talk about that at Super Connectivity? I don't remember. I yeah. think it was just... Yeah. Yeah, they have her in chains, but they don't chain her hair. Why does it move? <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, no, I mean, I'm just looking at this like, uh, Medusa, your hair's free. Use your use your super hair power. No, I mean, but if you would like me to live tweet that and anything else you can think of, uh. Follow me on Twitter's at Charlie Esser. That's C H A R L I E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle for quality. You should go on Fiverr and like offer to do people's voiceovers, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Quick way to make a buck. <laughs> I'm sorry, going on what? what what's a Fiverr? What's what's a it's... Fiverr.com? It's what like is... freelance work that starts at five dollars. This podcast is not sponsored by Fiverr, <laughs> but I'm obsessed with. Fiverr. Oh, okay. <laughs> Say hey you for know, five bucks. I'll do a quick voice intro. So, <laughs> uh, Phil, where can the lovely people find you? <laughs> did you already do yours? You just did the Cape to Lunatics. I just did Cape to Lunatics. Oh, uh, you can always email me nightwingpvp at gmail dot com and on Twitter I am at nightwingpvp. Uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm hopefully going to do start doing more live tweeting also. Maybe live tweet preacher? Nope. nope yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> As for me, you can find me uh, Sundays live tweeting Claws on TNT and Mondays VH1's Daytime Divas at 10 at Lil Hellfire for everything else. Adventures in FG, that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest at Adventures in FG. And of course, be sure to check out my website, adventuresinfangirling.com. That's all we have for you this week. So that's a goodbye from the Capes. Capes? Okay. <laughs> And <laughs> Lunatics! We'll put yeah, it right there one of go. these days. Or maybe that'll be the one again. I don't know. Of course. <laughs> Important, everybody! Yes. <laughs>